Welcome back. The Irish Writers Festival is really peaking now. We're so excited about the next session. All of the sessions have just been aflame with brilliance, with energy, with curiosity. Um, I'm sure you'll all agree that you've had just an amazing run of crazy writing and wild minds combining in unexpected ways. Um, I want to give a really heartfelt thanks to our partner organisations. The Embassy of Ireland and Culture Ireland have um, helped out immensely and threw a fantastic party last night. Um, we're all in love with the Doyle Collection Hotels who have hosted our writers in such magnificent style, my new favourite hotel. And of course, our lovely friends, Kirch Festival. Um, are you in here? They're buzzing about the place, but of course, without Kirch Festival, we would not have been able to put all of this together. Um, now, the next session is the mighty Kit de Waal, the Rodfather, thank you, Twitter, <laughs> and my favourite radio voice. Please come on stage, guys. It's Peter Curran, with whom we've all been to bed, by which I mean bunk bed. Sorry, did that go a bit weird? Anyway, a massive round of applause, please, for our fantastic events. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Um, I jump in there, folks. Uh, you're very welcome. Um, I'm so delighted that uh, the British uh, Library. Um, I don't know why I'm doing this standing up. This, but it feels improper, uh, you know, to sit down without saying this first, because um, the two people we're going to hear from have made um, such compelling and memorable marks on the cultural and literary landscape in lots of countries. Now, I'm hoping this will be a free-flowing chat beside an illegal turf fire, um, but hoping that you'll take the opportunity to, to join us and, and um, ask a few questions. But could I just say, it isn't an opportunity to take out that age, aged script that you stand up and rant um, at guests on the stage every time. Not to put a damper on it, but it'd be lovely to hear from you, but no pre-prepared statements of a revolutionary government about to arrive. <laughs> that would be really lovely of you if you could uh, re restrain yourself. Um, Kit the Val's uh, latest book, Without Warning and Only Sometimes, Scenes from an Unpredictable Childhood, um, is uh, an amazing work charting the vivid daydreams and sometimes lurid reality of life in 60s and 70s Birmingham with an Irish mother and a Caribbean father. Roddy Doyle's Life Without Children um, shows the pandemic um, allowing his characters to scrape away the years of experience and relationships to expose lives not lived with some mixed results. Please welcome Roddy Doyle and Kit Duval. <laughs> So I'm sure we can, between three of us, imagine a sort of turf fire, you know, lively but contemplative chat, that sort of thing. Uh, it struck me reading both your, your books that um, Ireland, uh, its people, the diaspora, the place has changed so much since you both started writing now. Have you felt yourselves, your antenna kind of having to be adjusted and sort of retuned a little bit, Roddy? Yes, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I recently did a book with a... Uh, I co-wrote a book with a boxer, Kelly Harrington. Uh, she won a gold medal for Ireland in the Olympics last year. And uh, she happens to be gay. And uh, she married, surprisingly enough, a woman in uh, April of this year. And we were going through the book and work, you know, doing her biography. And we both agreed that the fact that she was gay was probably the least interesting thing about her. Whereas if we'd been writing the book 20 years ago, we may not have mentioned the fact that it, was up, it would have been up to her to decide, right. but it might have been something that she wouldn't have been altogether confident or comfortable writing about. So, you know, that, it struck me, yeah, just so, uh, yeah, times constantly change. Mm. And, um, I mean, I've been writing now for nearly 40 years, and I, I, uh, I have to be alert to that all the time, just language, attitudes. I can't take for granted, for example, the whole north side, south side divide of the city anymore, Dublin, that is. There's a whole west side now that's kind of, from my point of view, unexplored. So it's always, uh, it's always a work in progress, so to speak, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm remembering back to the woman who walked into doors that uh, came out in the um, in early 90s or mid-90s. Mid and uh, it was seen as extraordinary, A, that a man, an Irish man, mm. should be writing about 
you know, uh, domestic violence and a woman being uh, brutalized, but also stylistically, uh, there was a resistance to you breaking out of, I suppose, the film version of Roddy Doyle, yeah. as opposed to the literary version. It was, that was deliberate, you know. I've always tried to do something different. Uh, I'd always be afraid of being stuck in a rut. Everything has to be a bit of an adventure, and not necessarily a nice adventure, but an adventure. So did you punch your mic up when you sat down? I pulled what up when I sat down? You pulled the mic up. <laughs> 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 nobody, nobody told me I was dangling. Well, I keep talking. <laughs> uh, what was the saying? Uh, you were talking about uh, that it was... Uh, I yeah, that very, was, was never done then. Very deliberate, and the, the first uh, the first three novels were straight lines. They were very linear, and then I well, I wanted to do something else, so I wrote Paddy Clark, and then I'd done that, and I wanted to do something else entirely different. So I went, in a way, I'd written about uh, an emotionally successful family, and I wanted to write about the next door neighbours, you know. Mm. And uh, I remember a, a publisher from a European country uh, saying to me after. Um, the woman who walked into the doors came out. Um, nobody wants to read this shit. Wow. Um, she wasn't my publisher when the book, the next <laughs> book came out. But, um, That's terrible. It was to a degree the attitude, yeah. But uh, funnily, you know, there was an assumption as well. The, the structure of the book, it's on three kind of parallel tracks. Her distant past, her recent past, and her present. And that was very deliberate, you know. And I remember listening to some guy on the radio saying, I'm not sure if it was deliberate, but the way the book is structured <laughs> is quite intelligent. <laughs> <laughs> like I was the monkey at the typewriter, you know? So, um, yeah. yeah. Uh, there's no... <laughs> Kit, did, did, have you ever had reviewers seeing hidden depths to your work? Yes, I've, I do. I've had people say... Um, in fact, I've had the opposite experience where people have said... Oh, when she used this sentence, she meant that. And I was going, I didn't actually. I was just, <laughs> it's like, you know, a woman's washing up, but the washing up is a metaphor for something. I was going, no, she's just washing up. Yeah. And they've given me an intelligence I never possessed in, in writing the book. And, and saying that, I remember reading the, the Trick to Time, and it's amazing evocation of a woman looking back on a sort of lost life and just thinking, you know, is this, is this going to be it? Is it me and my dolls and my shop? Or, you know, is this, are these mad romantic possibilities I'm thinking of at the moment? And, and, and it felt like an ancient, a story of ancient Ireland yes. at the time. So just tell us a wee bit about the genesis of that book. Um, I wanted, I'd written about Leon, who was eight, and for my next book, very much like Roddy just said, I just didn't want to go back to writing about children. I wanted to write about someone at the other end of the life. And when I first uh, started writing about Mona, she was, you know, it was a week, a couple of days before her 60th birthday. I was 57 at the time. And the way I imagined just a woman three years or older than me, she was, you know, beige, elasticated waist, <laughs> you know. Like, and I started writing, I was like, hang on a minute, she's three years older than me and I'm writing about a woman who's got possibilities. The, the youth of 60, really, um, not this sort of decrepit woman that I'd imagine. I don't know why, because I've just got a very, very strange view of my own youth, possibly. <laughs> I'm very <laughs> immature. So I had to recalibrate her and I used um, like two characters that are in the book, Pestilence and Famine, these two Irish women, and I... I based them on my grandmother. My grandmother had two sides to her. She was a vinegar tongue, bitchy woman, but full of love as well. And so I just made it into two people. <laughs> and so Pestilence, who was just a terrible woman, she was just like slicing and, and, and wicked. And then this lovely other soft sister. And I really wanted it to be started off as the relationship between those three women. Mm. And then it extrapolated out to include you know, the loss of a baby, and also the pub bombings. I wanted to talk about the pub bombings of Birmingham, which was uh, very present in my life as an Irish child, and I can remember um, the abuse that Irish people got in 1974 in Birmingham. It was not good to be Irish. I mean, my uncles had Irish accents, which they toned down. Mm. They stopped going to Irish pubs for the, the immediate aftermath of the pub bombings. And, of course... 
nobody looks at me and thinks I'm Irish. So I was hearing what English people were saying about Irish people in front of me because it was okay to say it. Mm. Um, and I, you know, I was 14 at the time and I never said, hang on a minute, I'm Irish. I was a complete coward and didn't sort of say I'm an Irish child. And they'd be talking about the dirty Irish, the liars, the terrorists, bombers, murderers, you know, just terrible things. And I'd just be at, at school or at a bus stop um, and I would just be sort of sitting there going, you know, it was, it was not a good time. And I wanted to address that, what it was like to be Irish in 1974 in Birmingham. Mm. And yet that sense of otherness has served you really well yes. in, in terms of just being able to sort of bring these worlds uh, yes. to life. And um, your, your latest book, A Memoir, um, has a very kind of, I suppose that there's a universality to a child kind of realising it doesn't have any power, power at all yes. in the world. But that sort of collision between uh, Irish culture and Caribbean culture. Well, it's a certain type of Caribbean man, I suppose, in, in, yes. in, in, in your dad. Um, uh, why did you hold back until now before writing a memoir um, like this? I was actually writing a novel and I was approached to write my memoir. Uh, and I just, I, I couldn't think of anything more boring than writing my memoir. But after enough flattery and hard cash, I decided to <laughs> reevaluate, reevaluate that. And I thought, actually, maybe there is a story. Um, so I, 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 I really um, had to think. I mean, obviously, you know, you write a novel, you're, you're God. You know, if someone needs to die, they die. Something needs to happen, it happens. It's very confining to write a memoir. If you're going to be truthful, because you have... No one, no one can die. You can't make somebody die if they didn't die in real life. So that was quite a challenge um, to, to, to find a plot because, you know, what is the plot of your own life? You're still alive, and unless you've done something extraordinary, it can be quite boring, which is why the memoir finishes when I'm 21 mm. because my childhood was interesting. I'm quite boring now. You know, I'm, I make jam, I knit, I go to Tesco's. That's not really yeah. interesting. My childhood was interesting because I had no power over it. But uh, at least uh, towards the end of the book, you actually managed to make your job interview sound exciting. Yes. So, you know, you served the reader, even though you were entering, as you say, that period of dullness that you now, yes. uh, now view, view it as. <laughs> um, Roddy, I was going to ask you about, um, you know, this idea that, you know, when you're drawing on sort of source material, um, for you, I've always wondered now uh, about you going into pubs on your own for a quiet pint. And sort of sitting there. You've always wondered. Yeah, always. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, I was only born wondering. Sporadically wondering. Born, yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, you're one of those guests when 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 you're asked a question, you go, "What do you What do you mean by that?" <laughs> <laughs> oh, I just saw the opportunity. Good so I grabbed it. Go exactly. on anyway. Can I just interrupt here? There's a scene that you write in Smile. Uh, quite a few scenes, but a particular scene in a pub and. I absolutely, I thought, God, you've nailed it. I've read it about three times and I thought, there's nothing much in it. And yet you've been in that pub. You've met those characters. It's so good. It's really yeah. good. I admit it. I've been in pubs. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> the writer's artifice is blown apart. I feel so much better. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. But, so you're going to ask me a question. I was, I was going to ask you just about that idea of just the atmosphere in the pub when Roddy Doyle goes in and sits down and people at the bar going, Jesus, do you think he's thought of anything yet? Well, have, have you said anything interesting or been characterful? I'm never interesting in a pub, no. Um, no, no but I'm thinking about the other people. Well, in my local, there's a guy who looks a bit like me. To look like me, you'd have to have a bit of a beard, glasses and no hair. <laughs> and people very often go up to him and ask him, are you Roddy Doyle? And he tells me, he brings me up to date on who's been asking. <laughs> None of them have asked me, am I Roddy Doyle? <laughs> he looks more like me than I do. <laughs> so I don't pay him or anything like that. He just happens to be in the place. Uh, so that's grand. No, I don't think, I've never, um, the people, my friends anyway, have never seen themselves in anything I've written. Or if they have, I've always forewarned them and said, do you remember the time we, we did this? I yeah. took a, a kind of fictionalized version. Yeah. I don't have conversations the way that, in, the, in the same way as say the two pints guys do. Yeah. 
So no, it's all fiction. The atmosphere of the pub, I mean, in my last novel, Love, it's kind of a trawl through Dublin pubs, and that's based on rock-solid research. Um, <laughs> Selfless. Years of, years and years of thankless <laughs> devotion to my craft. Wow. <laughs> Really? And then going home and writing the odd bit. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's largely, you know, you reach a point in your life where you look back more than you look forward because there's a lot more there than there is. <laughs> looking forward. The early books are about people striding forward. The later ones are about people looking backwards and trying yeah. to account for various things that happened. And I think that's where, why there would be a lot of pubs in what, because the pub is such a vital part of uh, my life when yeah. I was younger, yeah. And, and I suppose that uh, environments like that, they tend to sort of trigger uh, random memories. Things just kind of burst into Yeah, into not life just pubs, past. everything. Jeez, you know, I can't, cr I, I can't go down the road without something sparking off a memory these days. And there yeah. are, you know, even the bad ones are welcome, really. But the pubs, you know, it, it, you were saying as well, you know, there are some pubs in Dublin that seem exactly the same as they were 40 years ago. And of course, things have changed so much that there were pubs where you, a woman couldn't get served and a woman couldn't get served a pint. I remember even when I was going out with my wife at the beginning, there was a place that wouldn't serve her a pint. If you could, she could have two... two a half in a, in a lady's glass? Two of them. They'd happily give her a pint in two glasses. <laughs> you know, I'd have been happy with that arrangement. I think it's quite, <laughs> kind of quite stylish or whatever. Mm, showing but, the sensitive side. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the clientele has changed. And, of course, you know, I remember being hugely amused and impressed by the owl lads in the pubs and like they were about half my age now I'd say and I am that owl lad now you yeah. know so the whole the camera angle shifts and changes but it's an interesting it's an interesting world and it's a world that's not replicated anywhere else exactly no do you know exactly uh, so you know I'm quite parochial and that all my characters live and work in Dublin so I worked in a, for about four months in a, a bar in Stony Batter in the early 80s before it became, you know, sort of she see Clark's City Arms, which I think it's, it's in Clark's Hotel and, and, um, and uh, I nearly forgot the name of Ulysses for a minute there. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, one of the things, that sort of delicious anonymity, whether you're, you know, mining your own past or... Uh, you know, you're 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 sitting down in the in the blessed quietness uh, as a writer. What happens to you? How how do your your shape change when you have to spend half the year going around talking to agents like me about why you wrote that and so forth? Do you know what I mean? It's the, it's oh. the opposite of that solitary creative space, isn't it? I don't spend half the year wandering around. Um, I spend most of the year on my own. Well. Like I have a family, in it, but the working day is by myself, and that's it most of the time. But I'm quite happy. I don't know quite. I'm quite happy answering questions. I like, you know, the excuse to get out and mingle and talk to people is quite welcome, really. Uh, a bit bizarre when you're wearing a microphone and there's a <laughs> couple of dozen people listening to you. Yeah. But other than that, no, it's quite. Um, I wouldn't do it if I didn't enjoy it. You know. No, no, no. What, what? I did. You know, during the lockdown, I was supposed. I did the Vancouver. Literary festival on a Saturday night, and you think, "Oh, that's cool." He's gone to Vancouver, but no, I went upstairs to my office <laughs> exactly at the same time the Match of the Day music was starting, and it was hell. It was horrible, you know. Yeah. So this is really great, you know. Yeah. As long as I want, I'm not doing it next weekend, the weekend after the weekend. I don't know if I'm answering your question. But yeah, no, no, you are. No, yeah. It's interesting that, that, that you move sort of fluidly between the space. I mean, I'd uh, hate to hear myself complaining. Yeah. Oh, you know, okay. giving out. I'd hate to hear myself giving out. Yeah. Because why would I be here if I didn't want to be here? I know. Yeah. So if you hear people giving out about having to do it, they're. Yeah. Also, it's it's yeah. such a, a privilege to have to, to to speak to and hear from the people that read your books and buy your books and people mm. have bought a ticket. Yeah. Mm. Um, and you know, if there are many many good writers who don't get invited to literary festivals mm. and and they would love to. So I think it's a, it's a great privilege to be able to, to be invited and to be able to speak to people about your book, as long as, as I say, they don't ask you, if, you know, how wise you are to put something in your book, because normally it's not wisdom that's been put, put in something in your book. But it is... And also, also the questions that you get from the audience, they're usually just amazing. Mm, you know, yeah. you, you never... Things you never thought of. And I've had questions asked to me 
someone knows the book better than me. They've said, oh, on, on page 67, you know, when you said that, and you think, Jesus, do they like? <laughs> and it's a shock. It's a shock because someone's read it yeah. closer mm. than you ever intended. Yeah. We well, were both given out shite earlier. <laughs> and we'll both give out shite afterwards. <laughs> but we're both delighted to be here. Well, <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, you want to hear what they were saying about you backstage? <laughs> Um, it might be a good point, actually, to, to, to hear a reading. Um, uh, who would like to uh, give us a shout first? Feels, feels like school now, doesn't it? <laughs> I know, exactly. <laughs> There's only two people to choose I, from I, as well. I'll start, so then okay. I'll Okay. Do, do you want to set this up for I us? I will, I will. So when I was uh, sick, my mother's from Wexford, good Catholic girl, and when I... She met my dad. When I was six, she became a Jehovah's Witness. Somebody knocked the door, and as they do, and my mother fell for it hook, line and sinker, and our life changed. Mom gets baptised at the big assembly in London, and people start to call her sister. She learns all the rules and all the things that she has to do to actually get to paradise. All the studying and preaching and not smoking and not fornicating, nor swearing, nor stealing, or even thinking about stealing and giving a little bit of money if you can afford it and remembering the widow's might if you can't and making sure that everyone knows you're a Jehovah's Witness because otherwise you are like Peter who denied Jesus his best friend and grabbing every single opportunity to witness to people even in the most unusual circumstances like on the bus or at the park and answering questions at the Kingdom Hall by putting your hand up and reading out a scripture, and attending every single meeting, no matter what the weather, and deciding whether you want to be wheat or you want to be chaff, because the chaff gets blown away, but the wheat is not. Women not wearing trousers and men always wearing a suit and tie and never having a beard, because that would make them look like a hippie, but a moustache is okay. And women not teaching men, but knowing their place in God's order of things. And children remaining virgins until marriage and only marrying another Jehovah's Witness. And cutting out any bits of yourself that felt like they were turning you into a homosexual, which is an abomination unto the Lord. And remembering not to talk to anyone who used to be a Jehovah's Witness, but got themselves disfellowshipped. And from now on, if you were in doubt about anything whatsoever, there is a scripture in the Jehovah's Witness special edition of the Bible that can tell you how to behave and what to do. Play your cards right, keep the rules, and you will live forever. Of course, it's important to remember that Jehovah made us with free will. Maybe you don't want to keep the rules. Maybe you know other games that don't involve the Bible. If that's the case and you don't want to live forever, there is also something waiting for you. For the liars and thieves and people who watch Top of the Pops instead of going to the meeting and people who accept birthday cards and people who want to have sex with their boyfriend or girlfriend or boyfriend and girlfriend <laughs> and people who think him sound nice and anyone who is a Catholic or Muslim or Sikh, Christadelphian, Methodist, Baptist, Mormon, Seven-day Adventist, Church of England, Hindu, Jew, Atheist, Scientologist, Buddhist, or just plumb not interested, there is a terrible death waiting for them. They will die at Armageddon when God brings his righteous judgment on all the evil people in the world with earthquakes and floods and fires and death and destruction. There is not long to wait. No, the end will come in 1975. That was wonderful. It makes the Christian Brothers seem like lightweights. <laughs> <isn't> it? <laughs> it was, <yeah. laughs> um, just to, off the, the back of it, do you think maybe that thing about the very sort of vivid and acute sense of a clue uh, exclusion you felt, you know, not being able to join in school assembly hymns and, and stuff like that. It sounds maybe a, a crude correlation, but did that 
make your imagination uh, as a future writer explode? Definitely. I wouldn't have said so. I didn't know at the time, but obviously, you know, I've read the Bible maybe 10 times. There's great stories in the Bible that play of good and evil. Uh, being an outsider and observing, because you, very much you, you, as a Jehovah's Witness, you had to be an outsider. There's, you know, very, very often you're told to be no part of the world. So you observe and you observe a lot, and then you're getting all these stories, David and Goliath, Daniel and the lion, you know, all of those stuff. And I think it does help you to be, uh, to have your imagination, it helps you to be a writer, although I loathed it at the time. Mm -hmm. I didn't think, oh, this would be great when I become a writer. I was just like, <laughs> I wanted birthdays and Christmas, like all children, yeah. and, and never got them. Yeah, it's wonderful. Um, wonderfully described, <laughs> however horrific. But I'm, I'm glad the, 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 the yawning chasms and the paving stones didn't open and swallow you. Absolutely. Which is, that's quite, it's quite an opening um, to uh, Kids' book. It is, it's worthy of, you know, uh, a Hollywood thriller mm. or, you know, uh, a, a supernatural and, and um, sci-fi sci one. Uh, Roddy, f from that particular world that uh, Kit evokes, you're going to take us to somewhere different. Uh, yeah, I was writing a novel when... Um, the first lockdown occurred. And uh, once we got the hang of it in the house, you know, and I, uh, I was in England actually when it started, when the lockdown in Ireland started. And when I got home, I felt a bit like typhoid Mary. I, was, I thought I was gonna bring this pestilence into the house. Uh -huh. And uh, my wife had been telling me about social distancing and the two meter divide. And I didn't know whether you're supposed to do that in the house as well. Uh -huh. I really was late, do you know what I mean, late. But when I got the hang of it, I took out a novel I'd been working on and I realised it was completely redundant because the present day didn't exist anymore. So I was a bit lost, you know, so I started writing a short story based on a moment. And then I thought a month later, there's a different moment now because we've got into our stride a bit. And then throughout the first year of the pandemic, I was writing stories because I didn't trust the longer form, you know. And uh, so they're all in this book here. That's really interesting. The, 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 well, lack of per permanence, the insecurity cut, yeah. cut, cut you short. That's yeah, yeah. It was, uh, I mean, the whole, my, the, I, was, I had a novel coming out and it was pushed back. I had three theatrical productions that were postponed or cancelled. So the whole, my whole life, now I don't mean my whole life, I mean I was still living, breathing, walking two kilometres and walking home and, you know. Uh, so life was going on, grand, and I was still working, but if you like, the, the, the map of me year, the map of the next couple of years had just gone, disappeared, you wow. know. Uh, a couple of phone calls in the space of a week, and bang, Jesus. So I started writing the stories, and it was great to have, because the creative energy was there, but I didn't know what to do with it. So the stories were my way back in, so to speak. So this is called fun The Funeral. Lovely. I'm just going to read a few pages. Great. Uh, out loud as well. <laughs> I thought I would, I thought. <laughs> the last days had been hard. The last day, the day of the funeral, had been very hard. The Irish do funerals well, they say. Death doesn't frighten the Irish. They know all the right words. He was a legend. A saint she was, a saint. He did great things for this place. I'm sorry for your troubles. I used to love meeting her. He'd be missed around the town. They know how to sing. They know how to get drunk. They know how to stay polite for the day. If there's a genius, if there's a national flair, it's in the ability to get rat arsed and remain civil and cute, to let go and hold back, to wait. Except for one fucking idiot. <laughs> Bob was awake. There hadn't been a proper funeral and he hadn't been at it. He wasn't the fucking idiot, that was someone else. His wife, Nell, was asleep beside him. He was in his own bed. It shouldn't have surprised him. He'd been nowhere but home for months, but it did surprise him. He listened to her breathing, the slight lovely snore. He found his phone where he always left it, under the pillow, under the edge, nearest his side of the bed. He'd slept all night. There was daylight across the ceiling. The traffic was missing. There were no cars passing outside. The lockdown quiet. There wasn't a hangover. He'd earned one, he remembered that. He'd been drinking for days. But he felt great, free somehow, and clear, in his lungs, in his head. He'd get up quietly, he'd make the coffee, he'd scramble eggs, he'd stick on the radio, he'd take in the news, precise bits of COVID-19, the stats, the new language. He'd get back into the life. He was drunk, 
still drunk, lightly drunk, ballet dancer drunk. He was at the bottom of the stairs before he knew he'd been on the stairs. The descent had been effortless. More than that, miraculous, forgotten, weightless. He checked the man in the dressing gown. It was him. He looked back up the stairs. He'd come all that way. His sore shoulder wasn't sore. The pinched nerve had gone away. He was in the kitchen. He threw open the fridge door. It felt like weeks since he'd looked inside. There were one, two, there were seven cartons of milk. There were tomatoes, there was half a lemon, there were eggs, there was a box, there were eggs in the box, five eggs. He was up and running. His phone hopped on the counter. He grabbed it, afraid it would jump onto, into the gas, under the pot that he'd put there for the eggs. He lifted the pot, dropped the pot, singed the sleeve of his dressing gown. Boy, he was drunk. He could smell the cotton, if it was cotton. He could smell something else, something important. Hair. He'd singed the hair on the back of his head, the hand. He turned off the gas. He checked again. He'd turned it off. It was the fucking Egypt, the name on the screen. Bob, that you? The fucking Egypt who'd never have to, he, the fucking Egypt he'd never have to see or listen to again, ever. The fucking Egypt he'd pinned to the wall of the church the day before, only yesterday in the rain. But he wasn't sure about that detail. He didn't remember rain. He put his hand on the dressing gown on his chest. It wasn't wet. He didn't wear the dressing gown to, to the funeral. There'd been no rain, and he'd pinned no one to the, the wall of a church. There'd been no church. He was making up something that hadn't happened. There'd been a funeral, but he hadn't been there. Don't call me again, he said now into the phone. He put the phone back on the counter. He looked at the singed hair. He held it up to the light coming through the window. There was no real light. It was dark out. But there had been daylight upstairs at the gaps of the curtains and across the ceiling. That was why he'd got up. That was why he was in the kitchen. He looked at his watch. It was five o'clock, ten past five. He looked at his phone. It was ten past five there too. He'd been asleep for three hours. He was still in yesterday, still drunk, still not at the funeral. His mother was still dead. Fucking hell. <laughs> Fantastic. There is a, there's certainly a theme of, of uh, you know, people re-evaluating, seizing the moment to sort of uh, possibly let go, mm. to, to live the, the, the life that they, they uh, mightn't have, not wishing to, uh, you know, attach uh, work to the person who created it too much, but what effect did it have on you kind of personally, the, the, the pandemic? It was a pain in the arse. Why? Uh, it was, you know, at one level it was kind of, it's new life in a way. It was life lived in a way that I'd never lived it before. So that is interesting in a way. Uh, there was an absurdity to it that once we got over the, or at least I got over the notion of, uh, I remember taking very seriously the idea that a significant proportion of us were going to die. And uh, once that became less of a, certainty if you like the absurdity of it became almost enjoyable for a while the second lockdown i found really really difficult personally but january february only last year uh, really hard uh, you know in part because the days were so short also in part because i felt so isolated uh, i phoned somebody you know and it was the most extraordinary thing i, I realized oh you can do that and I phoned a fellow I hadn't seen in a good while. He lived in Belfast. And we had a chat for about 40 minutes. It had the biggest impact on me. It was incredible. So um, I'd forgotten, you know, and he was saying, yeah, I'd forgotten you could just do that as well. And it wasn't a Zoom, you know, you don't have to yeah. look yeah. interested or, <laughs> you know. You just, I actually had the sound down on the telly and was watching football while I spoke to him. Yeah. And yeah. it was great. It was yeah. great. So little things and big things. So the whole assortment of stuff. Uh, you know, a lot of living, a lot of observed stuff. Uh, I do think Ireland carried it very well, you know, about the government. We do have a government in Ireland that I can recommend that you should read mm. about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. The liberal democracy. States, statesmen and stateswomen, I believe they're called. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're in a thing called the EU as well. It's brilliant. Uh, I really look the after dreams you. of a madman. Just, man. just <laughs> sit back and do nothing and they look after you. So, um, yeah, 
I think in terms of government, it was very difficult actually to, I, I don't like the ideology of the current government, but I actually have to admire the way they carried themselves during those early months mm. and how they spoke and how there was a certain sense of unity and a certain fairness about it all. Mm. That reluctantly, I had to admit, oh, they're doing okay. Mm. You know, and that was, like, well, I don't know if it's a moment of growing yeah. up at my age or whether it was actually the case that they were doing okay. So there was a lot of, unex oh, clearly there was a lot of unexpected, uh, unexpected living. And, um, you know, and, and little things that are in the stories the sounds that we could hear, that we hadn't heard before. And then all these dogs. Did you get a lot of dogs? Was dogs yes. a big thing? Yeah. All these dogs yeah. and people training the dogs to be dogs out in the back garden. <laughs> and kids there all day, you know. And uh, no, tra the, the sheer, I live on quite a busy street, you know. But I could feel I was Clint Eastwood walking up the middle <laughs> of the street. Yeah. Yeah. It was great, you know, just striding. <laughs> Stri well, you know, as yeah, yeah. striding as I can manage. Downhill grand, but bit not, no, so not so much striding <laughs> uphill. But up the middle of the street, in the knowledge that nothing was going to come behind. Yeah, that's right. You Wait, know. Waiting for the click of a Winchester yeah. Ben Cox. So <laughs> and then top. another thing in the book, the first time we realised, there, there were two of the kids in the house and myself and my wife for the first lockdown, and we realised we could order a takeaway. You know, takeaway deliveries are now a vital, yeah. Yeah. you know, thing. And kind of when the takeaway was delivered and the, the guy kind of notified that, that the takeaway was out on the step and he was at the gate and like the four of us came out and waved, thank you. <laughs> 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 you know, well, there's only a fucking birdie on the step. <laughs> thank you, thank you. As if, you know, we'd been yeah. in yes. the it's Arctic fun. and he was a St. Bernard dog. <laughs> <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, you know, it wasn't without its humour. Yes. And I, you know, another thing I remember, my daughter said, I watched The Great British Bake Off for the first time. Mm -hmm. I knew it existed, but I'd never watched it. But because she was at home and we were, the three of us watched it together, and my daughter said, I used to watch it like I watched Match of the Day. <laughs> don't drop it, for fuck, don't drop it. Don't, <laughs> take it out, take it out. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. There was a lot of living, I think, compressed yeah. into those Intense. few years. Yeah, yeah. So enough to keep me going for a while. That's great. <laughs> yeah. I mean, one of the stories, the nurse um, here is, oh, yeah. is, is uh, incredible in, in uh, Life Without uh, Children. Uh, again, I suppose we're, we're, you know, the nurses in this country are about to walk out for the first time mm. in over 100 years. Uh, and are still being painted as being greedy mm. for some reason. But it's a very kind of, it's a wonderful, vivid corrective to the sort of life that people were living when they weren't selling PPE uh, to their friends and then ending up on reality TV shows for, for yes. 400 grand. Yeah. Yes. Um, but uh, from the point of view of, of uh, a writer who's putting together a collection, what makes you think, right, that's it, it is now complete, this collection of stories is, is done? It's just a gut feeling, really, you know, mm -hmm. I was writing the last one is called um, The Five Lamps, and it's set in the first days of the pandemic, but I wrote it a year later. And it was incredibly hard to go back that year. Mm. If you asked me to set something in 1980, I wouldn't even have to research it. I'd be in there immediately, you know, it's still in my head. But I asked me to set something a year and a half ago, incredibly hard. Yeah. Language we now take for granted that we didn't at the time. You know, antigen tests, again, social distancing, things that became so normal to use. Uh, it, it just they weren't there so I had to kind of take several hundred words out of my vocabulary and right. go right back only 12 months and start the story again and I thought well the way the story is going this is the last one so it is the last one so I knew it was done you know right so um, yeah and no, none of us when I was writing the others another would pop up but when I was writing this one no more popped up right so that's that's Seemed like a good enough your, reason your to stop. Yeah. Yeah. Rather than torture myself waiting for another one that wasn't going to happen. Yeah. Uh, and Kim, d dare I ask the, the, the sort of the effect of the, of the pandemic on someone who'd had a very busy professional life, mm. not as a writer, yeah. uh, but beforehand, was it? It was a joy to well, be yeah. locked down. Yeah. So yeah. I, I lived with my son i did then lived with my son who was 22 and you know he's full of energy and it was a killer for him because he was you know out with his friends out drinking football 
and all of a sudden he's at home with his mom, bored stiff. Um, I loved it, obviously, because I trapped him in the house and I got him all to myself. <laughs> uh, and he had no girlfriend or anything, and he was like prowling around and, oh, I can't do anything. So we ended up doing, I mean, you know, Amazon, which I hate for many reasons, was a godsend. I was just order some jigsaws. And he was like, a jigsaw? Fucking hell, Mom. <laughs> you know, I, said, no. I said, no, it will be good. It will be good. Because he's never done a jigsaw in his life. And we were doing uh, jigsaws of um, classic cars, which is his uh, obsession. And so it was really lovely to get... I'd never have had that time with him otherwise. Mm. It was just lovely to be... We'd sit and do a jigsaw. And of course, as anyone with children knows, especially with certain boys, I think, you can, if you're doing something else, you can talk about really important things. You ca I couldn't say, tell me about how you feel about something, because he wouldn't answer. But if we're doing this and there's no eye contact, I was getting all this information about what he thought about life, about any difficulties he was having. So I just loved it. He didn't know he was talking. He didn't know I was interrogating him. And I just got all the information, which was fantastic. He knows now. He knows now. <laughs> he knows now. Yes, exactly. And uh, we, you know, we, we got very close. I also did um, a big, with the BBC, a big digital um, festival, online book festival that had 107,000 people mm. visit it, which was great. And obviously I just got the ease. They did all the production and I just did the, I'll interview him, him, her. It was great. just great. It was, you know, picking, pick, cherry picking the things that I wanted to do. Um, so I didn't find it hard. And at the same time, just like Roddy says, you're very aware that people are dying um, and that it's, it was, it was nice for me. I love who I lived with. I like my home. I had enough to eat. I didn't have to go out of the house if I didn't want to. Mm. Very privileged uh, experience mm. of lockdown. I was healthy. My children were healthy. Um, for some people, and you were watching it every single day, it was, you know, nurses going to work. As you say now, that they've forgotten that these people were putting their lives on the line going mm. to work and dying. And now that they want a reasonable, if not small, pay rise, it's, you know, you can see it in the Sun, which is a piece of shit newspaper, um, slagging them off. You know, um, slagging off the people that were saving our lives not a year ago. Bin men, rail workers, postal workers, these people that were, when I was too scared to go out, they're going out. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, nurses have to pay... Um, for car parking. Yeah, ridiculous, ridiculous fees. You know, it's like, save our lives one week, now get your purse out because the pandemic's over. The short memories of the government, mm. because it's not people, it's the government, uh, who have used and abused people's goodness. Um, you know, it infuriates me beyond measure. It, it sort of suits that kind of constant churn, though, and, uh, you know, it, it suits your short memory Yes. Suits those who want to get away with stuff. I mean, yes. um, as well be they, you know, uh, governments or an audience trying to think of a question to ask authors. Um, I did point out at the start that we would love to hear from you. So if you've got a question uh, for Kit or Roddy, just stick your hand up and we'll get um, uh, a microphone to you. But we'll start at the back and work our way forward, <laughs> uh, which is the, yes, just top right over there. Here we go, yeah. So we're, we're just coming to you now. Thank you. It's a question for Kit, and it goes back to what you were saying earlier about your experience of witnessing the anti-Irish backlash in the mid-1970s. I grew up in Birmingham in an Irish family and experienced it at first hand. And when you try and put a frame of reference on that with retrospect, you say, well, maybe something good could have come from it that, you know, people would have got more reflective and less reactionary. But then I saw what's happened in the 21st century, post 9-11, and I can't help but have the feeling we've learned nothing because what you do see is just the actions of a tiny number of people conflated with an entire community or faith group. So do you have a similarly kind of unhelpfully bleak analysis or do you think there is something more positive here? that maybe there was something in what happened then? 
Because it, it, I just got that slightly doom-laden feeling that what I've witnessed happening to Muslim people in the 21st century just replicates what happened to Irish people in the 70s. Yes, I, I think it's exactly right that uh, the, the correlation between how people spoke about Irish people and how they speak about Muslims is exactly the same. Tiny group of people doing a very specific political act and it's the whole nation, it, it, it's, you know, it's everybody. Um, but I think I'm seeing the same thing now about migrants, about asylum seekers, people that are crossing the you know, very dangerous waters to come to England or, or elsewhere in the world. And of course, within that group, there might be one or two undesirable people, but it's being used as a political weaponry to say, oh, no one should come. They're all you know, t illegal immigrants, terrorists, whatever. Um, and I think we've learnt nothing at all um, expect that, except the political expediency of vilifying an entire group of people because of one or two people that might be doing something we agree with or not agree with. Um, did, did you want to ask a question? There's a woman just behind you. You had your hand up. Would you like to ask a question? Biden appealing to that, the fact that you have so many people claiming an um, Irish passport, and I think particularly with the troubles and with the views of, um, yeah, you know, Ireland before the Good Friday Agreement, um, I was just wondering if you had thoughts on nostalgia in sort of the new generation of Irish or Irish diaspora cultures? Um, I think, I know that me and my brothers and sisters had an Irish passport before uh, Brexit, what did make me laugh with Brexit was the people that were desperately looking for an Irish grandmother <laughs> or whatever, you know, because it was so, you know, it, it posed, you know, everyone wants now to find that Irish grandmother mm. so that they can get an EU passport. The but shame the, has been lifted. But there always has been, that, certainly in America as well, that nostalgia for Ireland and, and people say, oh, I'm Irish, you know, 18 generations ago. I don't think there's anything particularly wrong with that as long as it is, um, you know, not a serious thing. Because, uh, you know, it's... Uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with saying I'm Irish and having that nostalgia, but it is also slightly fake, uh, you know. And you can't expect Ireland to be the way... No. ..your ancestors left it in the late 19th century or <laughs> 20 years ago either. Uh, but it's... You it's, know. it's M far more progressive country than mm. this country is mm. now. Far more. Mm. It's it's new. It's forward thinking. It's inclusive. Uh, of of course, there's things wrong with Ireland. Of mm. course, there is. But my God, mm. compare it to the government of this country and what's happening. It's it's atrocious. Did, did uh, I went to see the uh, the Banshee of uh, Anna Sharon a couple, yeah. couple couple of weeks yes. ago and really liked it. But it's interesting yeah. how the coverage of that. I mean. Uh, Almost the, the Irishness of it was sort of uh, talked about in the press here as kind of, gosh, that beautiful isolation, all those seascapes and stuff. And the knitwear to die for, <laughs> the knitwear of those guys. And then they got to the kind of corrosive, repressed society. But had well, the fun. I have to be careful here because I've been promised a jumper. Have you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I really have to be careful here about what I said. I thought that film was brilliant. Yeah. Just brilliant. Every moment of it, I thought was brilliant. Yeah, yeah, and it's 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 the grief of friendship, isn't it? That uh, like, in a way, like Bru in Bruges, his first yeah, film was, was a form of friendship coming together. The two same two men coming together and the, yeah. the yeah. possibilities. And this one was a much more difficult ask because mm. it's never really explained why. And there's a lot of there's depression there. There's all sorts of stuff. Yeah. I just, he, I think they all achieved. It was a brilliant, brilliant it, film. It, thought, it yeah. was, I know. And I wanted to Brendan Gleeson's yeah. agent say, look, he was kind of lovable in in Bruges. Any chance of softening up this mysterious, misanthropic creature? I and mean, somebody close to me said, did he have to cut off all his fingers? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I've been promised a jumper. Yeah. yeah. Well, of yeah. course, we mustn't jeopardise that. No, no. Jesus, no. So I won't say anything. Uh, <laughs> hideous. Okay. Um, uh, hang on, but I'm working from the back. So, uh, yes, there's somebody up there who wanted to ask a question. Yeah. 
just we'll get a mic over to you there. Um, go ahead. Uh, this one's for, for Kit. Uh, but first of all, can I just say, it's what, what a privilege to have an esteemed broadcaster interviewing two, two esteemed writers. Oh, um, bless your heart. <laughs> <laughs> I have socialized with Peter, so I should put that in as a add on. Um, Never seen him before. <laughs> <laughs> but, but Kit, in, in terms of the sort of uh, competing heritage that you have, uh, a marketing friend of mine once described, if, if all nationalities were a brand, the Irish brand would be the strongest in the world. Yeah. So in that context, I mean, do the er other heritages affect your writing, you know, despite the blinding light of, of Irish heritage? Great question. Um, so West Indians, Caribbeans and Irish people are so alike. There's so much synergy between the cultures, um, between the, the place of women within the cultures as I experienced them and it's slightly different now, but at the time. So I had two grandmothers. I had. Irish Nana, who was just called Nana, and then I had Black Nana, and we called Black Nana Black Nana. And the two women, uh, they hated each other. You know, they, um, they were horrified that their children had married outside of their race, horrified. They both believed we were neither fish nor fowl, told us regularly, oh, God, the children, the children, they're neither one thing or the other. Um, and they just hated England, both of them. And they were the same woman in different skin. We could see that. Everything they said about their culture, everything they said about their view of the world, and more generally, the cultures are very, very, very similar. So it's not as much of a um, difference as people think. Mm. I think maybe, maybe you know, English to Irish is, is much more of a leap. Mm -hmm. But English to West Indian, it was, um, it was very, very, you know, very normal really, because there wasn't a great difference in food. I would say food, West Indian yeah. food slightly better. Um, <laughs> but otherwise... And the weather. So, <laughs> difficult question. Um, but it's a, I wonder, is, is it uh, overplaying it to say that there's an element of both being colonised yes, by the completely. English? And completely. That's I mean, the, the, the scent that where England sat in both of those communities was identical. Uh, colonised, oppressed unappreciated, um, you know, those, both of those communities were held the same place. You know, the, the phrase, no blacks, no dogs, no Irish, you know, there were two of my parents, and we didn't have a dog, but there were two, <laughs> both of my parents were sent to the same areas of Birmingham. You know, you could only live in certain areas, and, and so obviously mixed race children are going to result, but the, both children, uh, both nations were herded by the English into mm. very, very small pockets of the country. Mm. Yeah, no, you, you realise, of course, that, um, you know, Irish people have, uh, are still trying to parlay that into the same, as, same type of racism as people of colour have, have yeah. experienced, you know, uh, whereas before we just have to open our mouths before people dislike us. Yes. We're not hated on sight and people yes, don't yes, do it. Yes, 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 yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it, it was really anti-Irish sentiment, as I experienced, was brutal. Uh, but it, again, you could walk down the road and not necessarily experience it. Mm. Whereas if you're black and you walk down the road, mm -hmm. it's written mm. on your face, you know, on your skin. Whereas um, certainly if you lost your accent in the 70s, you could have a slightly easier time. But, it, you know, it wasn't that easy to lose your accent either. No, no. Um, yes, uh, just down here, this chap with a hat. Um, thanks. Um, my question is for Kit. I just finished your memoir. Really enjoyed it. I thought it was fantastic. Um, these questions are just born out of curiosity. Basically, I've heard you refer to yourself twice as a Irish and black writer, yes. as opposed to an Irish and Caribbean writer. I was yes. just curious about that. And also, I'm very curious about being a petition of petition descent in Birmingham. What was the impact of the Caribbean diaspora in Handsworth on your life to it, at that time and today? Yeah. Um, when I was um, probably up until 12, I was very in the Irish community. And because my mother had nine brothers and sisters, 
the Irish community around us was very strong. I would have described myself completely as an Irish child. Then I sort of got a black... I found Bob Marley, actually, <laughs> is what, how it happened. And he really awakened in me a very great sense of me being a black uh, West Indian Kittitian person. Uh, and I think I became much more aware of being black from 14 probably till to 20, where all, I wouldn't say I rejected being Irish, that would be impossible, but I really explored um, the racism, oppression. I learned a lot about my Caribbean history, about the diaspora, about being African. I certainly was very, very immersed in Rastafarian culture, lived it, went to live in Hansworth. Um, and it's only afterwards I found a way to integrate both of those identities. Until that time, and also, of course, if you were Ketitian in, uh, you know, part of the Caribbean community that's Ketitian, all of my friends were Jamaican, and I was really exploring Jamaican heritage, not Ketitian heritage, which is very different. Uh, but my dad was quite tight-lipped about his history. So it was a long journey um, to integrate both sides of my um, identity. It's quite an interesting journey to have. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, that's a fantastic question. Uh, yes, there's somebody up here had a question. Yep, go ahead. I just wonder um, about the idea of, you know, you were obviously really strong, um, strongly encouraged to write a memoir kit. And I, <laughs> so, fairly simple question. Are we living in a kind of golden age of memoir? Because there's a lot of memoir publishing going on, particularly in the 2020s. And maybe as a kind of slight barb to Roddy, um, has, um, has memoir perhaps usurped the novel? I, th I think there are some excellent memoirs out there. One I would recommend is by Ed O'Loughlin called The Last Good Funeral of the Year. That's like very similar pandemic, uh, his experience of the pandemic. Another one is uh, Did You Hear Mammy Died, which is about, uh, which is so good, so funny. Audiobooks, great version of both of them. Both of Gabriel Byrne's volumes of his autobiography, fantastic. I, I love biographies and I've read some of people I don't like just to hear what they say. Um, so I think it, it's a great form. I don't think it'll ever usurp the novel myself. I just, I love fiction, really do. Um, Rod Roddy, would you uh, would you come across as lovable if you were to write your autobiography? No. <laughs> Don't. I'm not interested in being lovable, to be honest with you. <laughs> no. um, yeah, I'm currently reading Bob um, Bob Mortimer's autobiography because I wanted to laugh, and I knew if I read it, even just thinking about Bob Mortimer would make me <laughs> laugh. And actually, I just laugh and laugh and laugh at it. So I think. There's, a, it's a, it, there's great essays and collections of essays out yeah. there. There's some brilliant stuff coming from Ireland. But I don't think one is going to usurp the other. I think it's a bit like, you know, say go back 10 years and you, you, you go to the BBC website, the football page, and your team has just bought Messi. And you think, fucking hell, we bought Messi. <laughs> and then half an hour later, they've bought Ronaldo. <laughs> so you have both of them. Right. Now, it probably would have ended in tears, <laughs> but nevertheless, you got the novel and the memoir. <laughs> thank you, same team. So I'm going to escape that. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but no, I don't feel... Uh, I don't, you know, I don't think one pushes the other no. aside, really. I no, no, it's no. Like, it's like television and radio, because when television came out, they said that was going to be the death of radio. Mm -hmm. And it isn't. You know, radio is strong, as strong as ever it was, yeah. if not stronger. Mm -hmm. So it's just different things, different ways of getting information. I think they're all great. I, I love books of essays I, and some mm. great, particularly mm. female essays coming and out. They've been it. here this weekend, you yeah. know, so, yeah. Yeah. Yes, th there's been another really good sessions apart from this one, <laughs> <laughs> apparently. Um, yeah, um, yes, somebody up there had their hand up. Or was it just a, an artful nose scratch? No, it's Yes, just, just here. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, I was reflecting on what you were saying about um, the post-Brexit rush for Irish passports because um, I was quite the opposite. I was probably one of the few people who after Brexit actually ran and 
just for whatever reason got a British passport while, while I still could. Um, but, uh, and also received several marriage proposals. Um, <laughs> but I, I was actually thinking on another point, um, which was um, one, uh, Roddy, that you were talking about, um, about uh, the Irish experience of death or the way that the Irish deal with death. Um, and I've definitely always felt, um, growing up in, in Donegal, that um, there was a kind of an obsession with death that almost skirted around it. Um, and, 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 you know, the sort of language that people use to, to talk about a death and, and they go from house to, you go from house to house and everyone be talking about it, the same death and oh, it was terrible. And, and, and I want, wanted to ask where you think that kind of real intrigue or I don't know if obsession is the right word with death comes from in Ireland, if it's a if it's uh, something that came from, you know, the experience of famine, death, or, or preceded that, and whether it's a healthy relationship that people have, because... Well, aye. Yeah. I'll, I'll just stop you there, because we, we do have, we have another session right off the back of us. So a quick word about death from Kit and How Roddy. So? <laughs> just, I feel fine at the moment, actually. <laughs> but uh, I think it's a kind of an acceptance that life is finite, and death is, death is something there are people in Ireland who much prefer funerals to weddings. Yeah. Yeah. I'm one of them personally. <laughs> yeah, you know, and it's not because I'm morbid, but I think it's an acceptance that life ends, you know, and I think whether that goes back to famine times, I don't know. I'm sure people knew they died before then and they know they died since. <laughs> and I suppose as well, it's one of the ways you cope because the island went from 8 million before the famine, to two million by the turn of the century. And that's still a trauma, you know? So how do people who are traumatizing, how, what do you do? You laugh, mm -hmm. you know, you fight, you laugh, all these things. And I think funerals, all this stuff bubbles through at funerals, you know? And there's a great, at an Irish funeral, I've been to fu funerals elsewhere, but there's nothing like a hug at an Irish funeral, you know? Mm. And how, important numbers are, you know? Yeah. So uh, funerals, I think, was probably one of the worst aspects of lockdown, and it was necessary, but when nobody was allowed to go to funerals. Luckily, nobody too close to me died during that time, but it would have been gut-wrenching not to have been able to go, yeah. you know? And not to have been able to do the tiny bit of adding to the numbers, you yeah. know? So yeah. uh, I don't, I think you might have used the word obsession. I, I wouldn't call it obsession, you know? I think it's part of the... If a, if a country can have a psyche, it's part of the national psyche, I think, and it's not a bad one either, you know? Um, I yeah. think it's, once, you, once more weight is thrown into funerals than weddings, that's a healthy, yeah. that's a healthy society, in my opinion. Yeah, exactly. And the dancing's always better. Yeah. Never danced at a funeral, funnily enough. They used, that was one of the reasons why churches uh, insisted on bodies being kept in the church overnight eventually, because at old, you know, uh, uh, old wakes, like two or three hundred years ago, they used to actually get the body up and dance with them. At the, wow. at but the only person in the room I'd be confident to dance with. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good yes. idea. Yes. It's a good idea. I'd dance with the dead anyway. Um, um, I, we do really have to wrap up, but uh, did you want to have a, a quick word on that? Um, the only thing I would say, again, it's one of the uh, similarities between the Irish and the Caribbean community. In the Caribbean community, there are professional mourners, women, who will go from, you know, to, doesn't matter, you don't have to know anybody. Mm. You turn up, you're treated with respect. There's a lot of food, there's joy. You know, the sorrow, obviously, but there's singing at the graveside, beautiful singing at the graveside. And there's, it's much more a celebration of life. You know, I've been to English funerals that are very, very, very serious and dour. And Caribbean funerals are not. There's mm. food, there's good times. It's a celebration of life. Um, and that's, again, another similarity between the Caribbean and the Irish communities. Yeah. And the, actually, the, the, the person that's gone actually comes to life in the laughter yes. and the memory and the yes. exchange of people mm -hmm. that, are, that are gathered in their name. Folks, we'll have to wrap it up there. Thanks so much <laughs> for your lovely questions. Um, and, um, and a big thank you to Roddy Doyle and Kit Deval.